And that was really my, kind of my COVID baby. Um, that's really what I worked on for most of uh, COVID in addition to all the other, you know, projects. I have a little production company. So we actually used 2020 to kind of catch up on writers and, you know, meetings and things like that. Puts everyone else to shame for the people who had a quiet year. <laughs> I think everyone had the year that they needed to have. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary output, like certainly for the start of 2021. Very <laughs> impressive. Have you written a few books as well last year? No, I haven't written any books. No, no. Literally, literally no books, okay. Hello, this is an interview with Mayan Bialik. It's the first in a series of conversations where I speak with successful actors, writers and directors and I ask for their advice and thoughts on how you can create art with whatever circumstances and whatever resources you have, however much or however little. In this conversation, I asked Mayan for her input, her advice for younger artists whose plans were put on hold during the whole COVID lockdown. Maybe they were planning to put on productions, go to drama school, music school, dance school. I also asked for her thoughts for more established actors, writers and creators. People have been working, but maybe their career hasn't worked out exactly as they had hoped. I hope you enjoy this interview. Please subscribe to the channel and over to Mayim. I'm here with Mayim Bialik, star of Beaches, Blossom, Big Bang Theory, author of Beyond the Sling, which I enjoyed reading, Girling Up, Boying Up, Mayim's Vegan Table, Call Me Cat, Mayim Bialik's Breakdown and Thank you, Mayim. I feel I feel like we've spoken a lot or nearly spent a lot of time together over the last seven years. Yes, I mean, you you are one of the people that have known me through a lot of transitions <laughs> of my life and career. Um, so it's really nice to talk to you. Yeah, you too, thank you, thank you. And, and my question is, how do you do it? Like, how are you doing it right now? There is, see, so you directed your film No, I haven't like, directed my film yet. So we I can thought, take that off the list. Oh, so you did that at the end of 2019. No. So because, well, because of COVID, you know, everything has been, um, you know, kind of shifting and shifted. Yeah. Um, so I did, in addition to like all these other things, I wrote a screenplay several years ago, um, which was announced before um, quarantine started, but we have not been able to film. So the question is, will we get to film this year? The year's not off to a fantastic COVID start, so we'll see. I see, and that's with Dustin Hoffman and Candice Bergen. Correct. Right, okay, well, hopefully soon. And then how did you, so did, were you filming Call Me Cat this year? Or was that- So we free? filmed, yeah, we literally, we have filmed six episodes and then we, or we filmed seven episodes, if you include the pilot, and then we have six more. So we started, you know, we started in the fall. Right. We're, you know, tested once a day, usually twice a day. Um, so the minimum is once a day. And then we've been on, you know, holiday break, which has been extended based on Screen Actors Guild um, rules. So then we go back and presumably we'll finish this season um, very soon. <laughs> Terrific. And I hope we can see it in England. Currently we're, we're user restricted. I've tried watching it. <laughs> I can I can just hold my phone up to uh, to my TV when it shows so you can see. Uh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's absolutely perfect. And and how many of the uh, Mind Bellic breakdown episodes have you done so far? I really enjoyed the first one. Oh, and thank you. Yeah, we'll come thank back to that later. Yeah, how many? Yeah, I think you're probably gonna like a lot of them because yeah. you know your connection with yoga, body movement, meditation, mindfulness, like all these things, you know, are things that you are familiar with. Every episode of my podcast is a different topic in either mental health or mental wellness. We have recorded 20 episodes and we just started rolling them out. Um, and just like to give it, you know, it's proper plug. We have a website, bialicbreakdown.com and you can also watch on YouTube. So my YouTube channel is also, you can literally watch it in real time um, or, um, or you can listen to it on Spotify or wherever people get podcasts. So that's been, that was really my kind of my COVID baby. Um, that's really what I worked on for most of uh, COVID in addition to all the other, you know, projects. I have a little production company. So we actually used 2020 to kind of catch up on writers and, you know, meetings and things like that. Um, but the mental health podcast is really what I mostly worked on and then went back to Call Me Cat, you know, just a couple months ago. It's terrific. It puts everyone else to shame for the people who had a quiet year. <laughs> I think everyone oh. had the year that they oh. needed to have. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary output, like certainly for the start of 2021. 
very <laughs> impressive. Have you written a few books as well last year? No, I haven't written any books. No, like, no. Literally, literally no books, okay. No. Uh, so, so the place this conversation started, which uh, I was really, part of the reason I wanted to reach out was thinking about the young artists, not just people from disadvantaged backgrounds, but, but that's definitely a part of it. But during the last year, everyone who wanted to go to drama school or dance school or acting school or art school, and suddenly that's all closed down. The training is thrown off for the time being. It's difficult enough to get the funds together and, and get to do all of that. Uh, for everyone who, the independent filmmakers who are starting out or even up and running, who are stuck in the way uh, uh, and everything is blocked. What what do you think about that? Like what what I mean, do you say? You know, I think that you know there are there are there are many repercussions. You know that I think we're still just starting to wrap our heads around um, in in terms of the impact. You know of this this year and this pandemic. And obviously, you know the most notable ones the the effects on the economy. Um, and yeah, the effects on our mental wellness, you know, a lot of people are suffering right now in ways that they hadn't before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I have kids, so I think of also the impact on kids who are learning on a computer screen, and that might not be the easiest way for certain kids to, you know, I'm thinking about all those things. But the point that you bring up is kind of the larger, you know, kind of existential crisis that I think many people are in. And yes, it's a good Jewish thing, existential crisis. Right, it's an existential. No, but but I think that's really that that is. It's like especially for artists, especially for people who you know make our living, um, you know, trying to find that path and trying to you know against all odds. And you know, many artists don't always get support from um, you know from their families the way that that people who want to be doctors and lawyers do. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are extra challenges already. And, um, you know, I think that that it, it's really, it's kind of the ultimate now, you know, challenge for people who are artistically inclined and who have been on a certain path, because in many ways, the year is kind of a wash, you know, uh, we can't, yeah. we can't count this year as the determining factor in the rest of our lives. I, I'm not the kind of person who says like, well, I guess the universe didn't want me to pursue my dream. Um, you know, we, we live in a universe that also has to live by the principles of science and the politics of a virus. So right. that's, that's kind of what we're all in together. Um, but obviously underserved communities, communities that don't have access, um, you know, to basic health care, to, to the resources that are needed to kind of bolster us through this. Those are the communities that also are hit the hardest. And we're starting to have more of a conversation about that. Yeah. Obviously, the United States has been through, you know, a heck of a year of reckoning. Um, and, and we're it's really still starting. Happening. Yeah. Uh, for the young artist who's thinking, OK, um, we'll, we'll take someone in an un underserved community, whether it's Compton or on a Native American base or, or um, reservation or wherever it happens to be. So someone who's facing challenges thinking, OK, I can't do this. I haven't got the money anyway. There's enough challenges. Like, what is something they can do? I mean, look, I don't, I don't know that I'm any sort of authority um, on this, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to take comfort in um, is that we are all in some aspect of this together, mm. and um, I'm, I'm also hopeful that there are going to be um, and will continue to be opportunities for things to continue to open up. Um, you know, I think that this is one of the this is one of the times when we see the power of the internet and the power of our ability to connect. Right. Um, and you know, to still be able to have dreams and to still be able to be part, you know, of a community. Um, and, you know, I think that's going to look different for everyone, but um, I know, especially for, um, again, for those of us who are artistically inclined, there, there is so much that we still can pull resources from, um, you know, it can, it can, it can still warm your heart to see how people are reaching out to each other. Um, there's so much negativity in the news, um, but there also is a lot of positivity and um, sometimes I just need, you know, to be reminded of that as well. And with the democratization of filmmaking right now, 
not right. necessarily the democratization of distribution, but that too. I mean, the, the cream can rise sure. to the top or the luck can rise to the top. Sure. In terms of someone who's setting out to be an actor, how long would you say they should give it? You know, in, in living, <laughs> living- That's a really hard question. But, I mean- Yeah. I, I think the question is, it's what are you doing in the meantime that I think determines how long you can give it, right? Right. right. So if let's just say, um, let's take for an example, let's say this is something you want to do, right? And you you decide to do nothing else in the meantime. You're just gonna see how long your savings can last, right? right. That's not gonna last very long. No. But most people who want to be actors have a plan B, meaning. They wait tables, you know, they they use their other skills to to do things in life. You know, m most people I would say are, are not independently wealthy and have the ability to just like move to Hollywood and see what happens, right? Oh. Um, so there's the things that you do with your life when you're not, you know, having that success you dreamed of as an actor that I think determines how long you give it a shot. Right. Because m my feeling is, no one can tell you you're not an actor simply because you're not employed, right? No, no one, no one gets to say you're an actor if you work, but not if you don't. I like that. So mm -hmm. some people, some people enjoy the craft and the experience so much that they are in theater and they audition for things and they keep chipping away at it. And they have the thing that they do to make money, you know, to pay the bills and those kinds of people sometimes want to do that their entire lives and it can work for those people. Right. But I think when you have a notion of like, here's the success I want, then you're setting your own timeline, which honestly I think can be really demoralizing because you know, you're, you're setting this expectation that doesn't take into account all of the factors, you know, that are involved. Many, many great actors never get cast in something. That's, that's how it is. It's a very strange business. And have you met them? <laughs> I've met them, I've dated them. Um, but no one ever says, no one ever says to, you know, a carpenter or an accountant, like, you are the perfect person for this job, but I don't like your voice, right? right. It's like, it doesn't happen. But in our business, you can be the best actor for a job and still be told, we're going to go with someone who doesn't act as well because their breasts are bigger. Like, that's or, like they've got, or, or they've got more of an Instagram following. Exactly, or they have more of an Instagram following. So to me, it really is about kind of like adjusting expectations. Yeah. And if, you, if it is causing you pain and strife and you are feeling bad about yourself or you're starting to make the list of all the things you need to do to yourself, like I need to get my teeth whitened and I need to do this. And if only I looked like this, then I'd get work. If only I took these classes or this expensive acting coach, then, you know, once you set those things, I think that chips away at really your experience as a human, because being an actor, that's not your entire existence. It's not, right. it's not who you are. Who you are is the things that you believe in, the people you love. Um, you know, you and I both connect on a spiritual and religious level. Like those things drive me. If you took away my ability to act, I'm still a person, you know? Well, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it's interesting you, like the, the way you're phrasing it. Um, I think firstly, in the the um, the beauty or the external issue, I, I really like what you said on your podcast in terms of the inside, the outside. Like that was that was very because I, I remember once being in front of the casting director. She was on the phone to her partner, and she's like, "Yeah, I've got this guy in front of me." Well, he's not the romantic lead. He's kind of got this quirky look. I'm like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, I was like 20, 20 years old. <laughs> or, or um, but one thing I've found is whenever I try walking away from it, it comes after me, and it's not. Yeah. Not like one, you know, one of the fame, the fame. That's nice, but like, just the craft of it, just the heart of it, the soul of it. Like, it, it can't seem to get away. You know, right. just when you think you're out, it pulls you back in. Right, but not everyone. I mean, a lot of my friends from right. drama school, they're able to, they're able to call it. So I've just been living in in LA for ten years, and now I've come back to England, at least for the time being, pandemic related, be close to my parents. But like, what do you say to the actor who hasn't? made it who hasn't had the break i mean you know i i think it's 
th there are so many decisions, you know, that we make as creative people in terms of what we want our life to look like, you know, and I was raised in the industry and then I left, you know, for the very reasons that the industry makes a lot of people crazy. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm happy and, and really honored, you know, that I get to live my life right now as an employed actor. Um, but most actors, you know, in this city and, you know, they're, they're not, they don't get that opportunity to be constantly employed. Right. And it really depends on what lifestyle you want to have. And, you know, I have friends who, you know, work commercials and um, also, you know, do personal assisting on the side. Uh, I have friends who hope to get enough work to pay the bills but do transcription on the side. Right. So almost every friend of mine who's not a constantly employed actor, which is most of my friends, um, they, they have to do something else. And then they get to frame their life in terms of, is it still worth it for me? You know, And it's a very personal decision. Um, and especially with this past year, it's hit people really hard. People who were relying on auditions and things like that, the industry's really shifted also you know, celebrities have moved into a lot of roles that used to be taken by actors who were not celebrities. Right. You know, commercials have shifted. The world of voiceover has completely shifted. And even guest spots, it's now, it's like who has a name and who's offer only. So the industry is really changing. And cameo.com. Right, exactly. I mean, for me, I, I left the industry and was happily a neuroscience, you know, student and then was teaching neuroscience and raising my kids. So. <laughs> Which is, and right, that was that was a very strong plan B. Right, <laughs> I guess so. Not that you need a plan B, but like, like. No, but no, but honestly, you know, I mean, I'm yeah. It's it is a very difficult industry, and and a lot of it does also depend on your ability to manage your anxiety around it. You know, which is what was very resonant from your first breakdown, not your breakdown, your first breakdown <laughs> episode. Hopefully no breakdowns. And <laughs> and I didn't know if I was gonna ask this or I don't know if I'll cut it, but but when do you talk about mental health? Now you've been very, very open, very open about it. Yeah. It's very inspiring. When is a good time to share it? The decision to you know share mental health struggles is obviously a, a very personal one. There's not kind of one right way to do it. And I will say that, um, you know, when I wasn't in the public eye, it was a time when we didn't talk about mental illness, like nobody talked about it. Right. And, you know, when I was growing up in the house that I was growing up or even with the grandparents that I had, like, no, we didn't talk about it like that. Nobody knew to talk about it. Right. Um, it wasn't until suicide touched my family that I realized the, the gravity of the situation, not just for me, but for our entire world, you know, in terms of what we're afraid to talk about. And it was so painful to me that we couldn't talk about it in the hopes that it would really benefit the rest of the family, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of risk factors and, and having an open conversation. I've been inspired to share more about mental health really only because I have a platform to do so right. um, for exactly the reasons that you're talking about or that anyone would think about. Um, you do worry what people will think. People still equate mental illness with, uh, oftentimes with bad choices, you know, like, well, if you just cheered up, you know, like, oh. like yeah. take a walk, like, oh, maybe you need to eat meat. People love to tell me that. I think you need to eat meat. That's why you're depressed. Mm, that's actually, well, I mean, there are absolutely dietary factors, but no, that's not the solution. Um, and also, you know, don't worry so much. Just don't worry so much. And that's not like for those of us- don't, who one. don't take everything so seriously. Exactly. That's like completely not helpful. And so what, what I've learned also as a neuroscientist is that we are born, you know, with a particular template and we're born with a set of coping mechanisms. Um, those coping mechanisms are, are both genetic, meaning we do inherit uh, proteins that code the way we perceive information and the way we deliver information. And also we grow up in an environment that teaches us what normal is, you know, and, and what feels good and what doesn't. So um, I think that one of the things I hope being a person with a public platform talking about this will do um, is to increasingly destigmatize it 
so that people can see that there's not really a beginning and an end of mental health. It's a constant state that we're all living in, which is a spectrum. And some people will get a diagnosis of bipolar or bipolar two, and some people will um, adapt, gain tools, take medication. There are absolutely shifts throughout our lives right. that also reveal different ways that we deal with our chemistry. So that's really a constantly evolving process as well. Um, but there's a lot of fear around it still. There's a lot of fear, but I hope that by talking about it and there's a lot of people, I mean, you know, every day I hear of, uh, you know, a sports star, a, a very famous singer, an A-list actor who's talking about it. And honestly, that is important. It does touch all of us and you still can be a productive person in society, have personal success, be married, have relationships, have children. I was told when I got pregnant, you should never breastfeed because it's going to trigger mania. And if I had listened to that one doctor who meant well, yeah. it would have changed yeah. my entire Higher, it would have changed my entire experience. And I'm not saying that would have been, you know, the, the, the most horrible thing in the world. I'm just saying we're told things by professionals that we now know need to be tempered with all of the other things we're learning about mental health. Thank you. Well, I really want to thank you. It's, a, it's an amazing service you're doing. It's going to help a lot of people. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Know, full, full credit to you. And thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it. And for your friendship. Thank and looking forward to seeing the series when we're allowed to watch it in England. Awesome. The when when they when we're we're based on a BBC show called Miranda. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are definitely, you know, uh, we we are a different sense of humor because we have to be. Um, and you know, I kind of divide humans into people who understand Faulty Towers and Monty Python and people who don't. <laughs> so that's the difference between you know your comedy and and ours. Um, but I know that a lot of people, um, you know, who love the original Miranda have really appreciated the American take on it. So we hope that when it eventually gets to you, you will appreciate it as well. We are going to appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, leave a comment and share with your friends. I look forward to seeing you again.